Hello, everybody. I am uh, really happy to see everyone here today. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Summer Decker. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm really excited to present today's uh, webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about education and training when you are building your uh, 3D printing lab. Um, most of us are in hospitals or at medical schools. Um, and, and this is a question that we get asked a lot is about how do you train people? Who do you train? Um, and, and the education component. So we're really excited today um, for the 3D SIG to allow us to present today. Um, we actually represent um, the um, 3D uh, SIGS Education Committee. Um, we, if you haven't heard of us, we are a subgroup of the 3D SIG. And we had our first meeting around the end of January and we had a really good turnout. Um, we had over 15 people present and a whole bunch of people signed up via email. And we had a lot of topics of interest because I think education is a real interest to many of us. And as we look at where the field is going in general, um, how we are going to get to that next level with uh, the CPT codes, how we're going to get to that next group of people coming in and, and helping us with that and setting up more teams. It all, a lot of it comes back to education and training. And so there were topics that were brought up by the SIG um, members, um, such as credentialing, um, how to teach medical students and residents and engineers, even art and design students. Um, people talked about their um, high school students and earn internships they were working on. And our major goal is to create curriculum tools for trainees um, so that we can really build the workforce in this. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to be hosting, thanks to the SIG, they're allowing us to host a number of webinars and meetings. Future webinars, we will be talking specifically about um, curriculum, um, things that we can do specifically to teach, professional training opportunities, and how to train professionals in this, and even setting educational standards for the field, which is definitely coming up um, as we go um, and more formalize and professionalize this. So soon you will see a call coming out for a committee meeting for the education committee. So I do hope that you will uh, sign up and join us um, if you are interested in this topic and, uh, and, and really contribute to how the field is going to be seen as the future. Um, that's what we feel really passionate about. So our speakers today, um, uh, again, my name is Dr. Summer Decker. I'm gonna be your moderator today and I chair the RSNA um, SIG on uh, the education committee. I am the director of 3D clinical applications at the University of South Florida um, College of Medicine here at Tampa General Hospital. Um, so I run the 3D team here um, at our hospital. And additionally today we have uh, Amy Alexander who is the unit head um, and in the division of uh, biomechanical development and applied computational engineering, quite a mouthful, in the division of engineering um, at the Mayo Clinic um, in Rochester. So we're very excited to have her today. And also Dr. Justin Ryan, who is the director of the Webster Foundation 3D Innovations Lab at Rady Children's Hospital. We tried to get a bit of a range of um, people to speak today, um, talk about the different opportunities that they've had their experiences in this. So I know a lot of you guys have heard about uh, what we do in education. We like to talk about it from our team, but I just wanted to give um, a couple of slides here to explain for our division, we really do rely on a wide variety of people supporting the team. And that comes from not only our radiologists uh, here within the Department of Radiology, but from our medical residents, our medical students, graduate students, um, and occasionally we have gotten people from outside like high school students that are interested in this. And so education and how to train everyone and the role that they can play has been very important to our team. And so we spent a lot of time um, setting up medical student training. Um, we have that built in now into the medical student curriculum for the medical school. And so we, as you can see here, we have opportunities for our medical students to come and rotate with us. Um, some of them have stayed for four years, um, and we often even get them as they come out of the medical school and they match with our residency program, and, and we've vetted them. We know that they, they work really hard, um, and so we're excited to have them with us. Um, but there's a lot of interest from medical students, so it's a real rich opportunity for them to get involved and, and for them to see what they can do in the field of not just in 3D printing, but in radiology in general. 
Another big area um, that we have been really excited about is we have a dedicated resident rotation, clinical resident rotation um, here at our hospital. We've been doing it for a number of years now um, where all of our residents come through our program and they spend at least a month with us. Many of them come back um, during their clinical electives that they have during their residency. And so they learn everything from when the patient's in the scanner all the way through handing off that print, getting that feedback from the surgeons um, that we collaborate with. And they really love this rotation. I I know I'm biased, of course, but they, the feedback we get from it is that they love being part of that component of it. And instead of just having a you know an order for a report and a report going back to them, they're actually sitting down and really communicating. So they're learning skill sets of how to collaborate and how to be that colleague um, to other specialties. And the other thing they hear is about when things go well and they love hearing that feedback, hey, that really helped or we couldn't have done this without them. And that sometimes that's lost. And when you put that order into a system and you know off it goes into the EMR. And so we've been training our residents specifically and our fellows, and a lot of them have gone off to even private practice or academics um, and continuing their interest in 3D. So that's what I wanted to start as we start talking about um, our topics today. We wanted to give you guys an understanding of like how we're doing it and then open it up for a Q&A session on exactly where can we go with this. Um, maybe there's um, people that you haven't thought about working in your lab and how to train them. And we hope to be able to provide that for you. If you are interested in the 3D um, SIG Education Committee, I highly encourage you to reach out to me or reach out to the SIG board um, and they will connect you with me. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to have more people on board. Um, with that, I am going to hand it over to um, Amy Alexander and ask her um, to present your uh, slides for us today um, on your experience at Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Summer. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today to the group. And thanks to everyone for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. So um, the most difficult thing of preparing for today for me was that there are so many facets of education and and things to highlight on the impact of education and training um, related to medical 3D printing that I hard, had a hard time narrowing it down. So as I go through my slides, I'm going to make comments on things that I don't actually cover with uh, full links or slides in my presentation, but things that we could all talk about um, at a later time. Um, so the topic, of course, medical 3D printing, um, a lab and its impact on education and training. The five areas I want to talk about are, you know, really starting chronologically in the life of a future professional who would want to go into this field, starting with elementary and middle school outreach, um, moving up into high school outreach and student participation, and um, going into more deep experience options and opportunities for uh, professionals at various levels, a technical professional, uh, an RT, undergraduate, graduate, medical student, residents, fellows, and consultants. Um, additionally, I want to highlight some of the efforts that are going on with uh, my colleagues here at Mayo Clinic in simulation, and also uh, speak on a new development, which is uh, the creation of a procedural skills center um, here in Rochester. So at the elementary and middle school level, um, there are so many opportunities for professionals to reach out and, and impact these youth. Um, this is just a couple of smatterings from when I, you know, I knew that we, uh, our Rochester Public Library had a 3D printer and that it's actually free to submit um, a part for printing and get that printed. And so a lot of students in the area won't know about that unless someone explains it to them and can help them prepare uh, a part that they, they may want to print. Um, I also encourage people to reach out to folks who are um, in the, you know, grades one through eight range. I did find in our Rochester area community ed that there is a grade one through eight 3D printing and CAD course um, being taught over the summer for a number of weeks. And I just thought how, how exciting and how interesting and how easy would it be for me to get in touch with them and, you know, say, hey, I can pop in one of the days and just show a few medical models or, you know, discuss uh, 3D printing in medicine and just open their eyes to the fact that this field exists. 
Um, and that's that's the goal really with the, the elementary, middle school and high school outreach is to expose the field, ignite that interest and talk about possible pathways. Um, you don't have to be aspiring to be a medical doctor to get into medical 3D printing, as we all know. You can, uh, you can be an artist, you can be an engineer, you can be you know, a student who's just learning about these things. Uh, let me see if I can move this out of the way. So with that, um, I'll talk about high school outreach. Um, again, reach out to your, your local school districts. Um, I have never been uh, turned down. I've met people through various connections through mutual friends or professional contacts, and they're always uh, just dying to get some interesting professionals in to give uh, just brief discussions and brief talks on, on what they do and expose the, um, the idea of this profession to young people. Uh, we did also participate in 2019, we participated in a regenerative medicine um, grant. Um, the chair of Division of Engineering, Mark Weed, applied for and received the grant. And with that, we were able to um, host somewhere between 20 and 30 local high school teachers. And we, for the day, and maybe it was two days, we taught them through basics of designing a part, um, preparation for print, how to orient support um, and, and get the print going. And as you see in the lower right-hand corner is all the <laughs> monoprice select minis. I think they're the V2s, um, you know, 200 bucks a printer. And we were able to teach these teachers how to prepare a print. And then they were able to take this printer home or to their classroom and, and share that with their students. So you're teaching the teachers, which is proliferating the knowledge that way. And I, I just was so um, blessed and grateful to participate in that with, with Mark and uh, my colleague, Robbie, and a number of others. Uh, Mayo Clinic also does a career observation, and I would I would bet that your local um, institution or your company also does something like this, um, where a high school or an undergrad student can come in for a one day or up to a one week exploration, um, where they just kind of shadow and um, follow you around for your day and see what you do, and and again that's just. Um, increasing the, the pool of candidates that are going to maybe go into this field so that we can fill some of those jobs that are going unfilled right now. Um, the other way you can reach high school students is by um, participating in um, nonprofits. Um, I've done a couple of keynotes or uh, talks for award shows and fundraising events. Um, and this summer, I'm, I'm very blessed to participate in a program um, it's a job shadow experience for students with technology interests and who identify as a women, gender, queer, or non-binary. Um, and, you know, just being involved in that MNAIC, which is Minnesota um, Aspirations in Computing, got me that connection. And now I'm going to have two days this summer where four or five students are coming on site and, um, and going to be following and shadowing for the day. Um, a lot of mentorships are available. Um, this is the list of 110 honorees for this year's uh, 2022 uh, Minnesota Aspirations in Computing Awards, and these students will all receive scholarships toward their undergraduate education. Okay, so the field of um, certifications, certificates, um, textbooks, and educational programs I did not get into very deeply because I wanted to keep this a little bit shorter and sweet. If you are a member of the 3D printing SIG, there's a PDF on um, the SIG website under the, I think it's under folders or under content. Um, it's under the education committee for engineers and techs. It's, it's a little outdated now, maybe a couple of years, uh, but it's got lists of undergraduate programs, graduate degrees, and some of the books that have come out. I do also wanna highlight a book um, that I collaborated with my colleague, Dr. Nicole Wake, uh, GE Healthcare on. She has edited and, and authored a book recently, 3D Printing for the Radiologist. I highly recommend that book, obviously, because I'm a co-author, but um, more so because it's, it's actually useful and helpful. Um, anyway, so we can talk another day about books and programs, but I just wanted to mention two of the certifications that I have personal experience in, um, the Added Manufacturing Fundamentals from SME, um, which is uh, man managed and written by uh, Dr. Shiku Kamara, um, Milwaukee School of Engineering, the Dean of Applied Research. 
and has uh, a lot of history there in the rapid prototyping center, which is of course added in manufacturing. Um, he also came out with a recent book, Fundamentals of AM for the Practitioner. I have not read this one yet, but I'm guessing that it's got some good information given that he's been in the field for, I think, about 30 years. Um, additionally, MIT has an added manufacturing for innovation, design, and production. Uh, it's a course, and you do get a certificate after you pass the course. I think passing is above 70 or something like that. Um, and all of our, our Mayo Clinic engineering additive staff either have taken the course and passed or are actively enrolled. Um, this is Professor um, Dr. John Hart from MIT who does uh, the majority of the, the video content for that course and he's just phenomenal. I wanted to also highlight uh, some SIG members and their recent achievements. Um, Clarkson College now has a radiology technologist certificate um, it's two to four semesters, and I believe it's four RTs who are already registered. At least that's what I gleaned from the website. I don't know everything about that, um, but let Gabe Link, he's here. Um, you can certainly uh, reach out to him. Uh, he is a, a member of the RSNA 3 SIG, um, and his colleagues as well are, are very open and um, willing to answer any of your questions, I believe, if you have any on this RT certification. Okay, so I also want to talk about the options for under undergraduates. Um, you can still do a career observation or awareness if they don't have a lot of time. You can get them in that way and kind of ex explore uh, various areas that are doing 3D printing at your institution. Um, a lot of places will have an undergraduate research employment program or something like a summer undergraduate research uh, surf program. Um, those are fairly common. Uh, usually they are during the summers because um, many of, at least our undergraduates are typically um, from Rochester, they go off to school and then they come home for the summer and this is uh, their summer gig. And I did want to point out that many of our undergrad students have the opportunity to uh, submit a poster for, for publication, either um, Mayo Clinic Proceedings or in our undergraduate poster show or, and sometimes even at um, uh, national conferences. I, I know we've done some at BMES um, and I think SME as well. Um, they usually get connected with a resident fellow or consultant and, and kind of take a model from start to finish or a device from start to finish. Sometimes they have an opportunity to be first author on something. This is Nika, uh, one of my students, this is her right here, a student from 2018, I believe summer of 2018, and this is her poster. Um, she used a black bone MR and attempted to segment the skull from it and compare it to the same patient with a CT. Very interesting stuff there. Graduate experience in education. Um, this is also something that your local institution may have. Um, it's very similar to the UREP, the undergraduate, uh, but it's typically more long-term and definitely will um, lead to possibilities for publication, opportunities for first author. A lot of our graduate students have been students that are taking a gap year in between undergraduate and graduate work, um, and they are working on just publications. And so we've got a number of technical notes out there, and this is a, a recent publication in operative neurosurgery um, that my student Bakhtri worked on. Uh, medical student experience in education. So Mayo Clinic does have a medical student. If, if your institution doesn't have one or you're not linked with one, you could always contact your local medical school and, and offer tours. Uh, we do tours of the anatomic modeling unit, the additive manufacturing facility and DOE, as well as through our bioprinting research labs in orthopedic surgery and cardiovascular research. If you're um, trying to quickly take pictures or uh, write down these links or something, um, no worries, just let me know and I'm happy to send these off. I also sent Ali a, a PDF of these slides right before I began. Um, so again, medical students, you know, they can do ro rotations in radiology. It's not, it's not extremely common, but I think we've had one or two over the years. Um, they will typically train under Dr. Jay Morris, who's the medical director of the anatomic modeling unit and, um, and work with a radiologist or an engineer to understand the basics of protocol um, for image acquisition that is compatible with 3D modeling and the ba basic practices of segmentation, CAD, print prep, job removal, post-processing. Um, and again, 
could lead to possible opportunities for publication. Medical students are usually hungry for that. And I think we can all agree that in our field, there's really no shortage of content that can go into um, a case study or a technical note. What we need to be working on also, just side note, um, are those prospective um, double-blind studies so that we can get some of that quantitative data in the literature. Um, we work with residents and fellows as well. Um, kind of the same thing here. We're gonna show um, some examples. This is a, an LAA, a left atrial appendage. Um, so segmentation of the left, left atrium out of the wall. Um, so this is a, 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 res, a resident who's learning how to segment. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend having many of them because it does take quite a bit of time to get them up to speed. Um, and it's not that they're not capable, it's just that it will take time away from your daily work. Um, and then anyway, here's, here's Dr. El Sabah, um, who was a resident in cardiovascular surgery. He's fitting a Watchman device for that um, appendage. And then this is Dr. Morrissey. Um, he was in hand surgery and he took a micro CT of a uh, vascularized cadaver scaphoid and created a model, which was absolutely stunning, but it took him forever because it was a micro CT and it, um, you know, it was a ton of data, a lot of hand, um, hand selecting the arteries. Our consultants also work all the time with education and 3D printing. This is a picture that both makes me cringe and makes me somewhat proud. Um, we ended up 3D printing 37 full uh, distal arms for Dr. Mur Mori in, I think it was like 2016. Um, they all have magnets in them that connect the distal humerus to the ulna and the radius, and then the radius to the ulna at the distal end as well. This was a massive uh, cost and a massive undertaking, but it was what he requested and he had the funding and we just went for it and we printed this on our object 350, I believe. Um, so a number of different builds to get him these elbows that he then used for a surgical training course. And so people were paying a lot of money to come and sit with him and learn his surgical techniques. And this is the way he wanted to teach it. Uh, Mayo Clinic also has a number of simulation centers. There's this new procedural skills center being, uh, being created. There's anatomic modeling, of course. And then, like I mentioned before, the bioprinting research labs. So the sim centers um, engage in traditional simulation, medical simulation of events or procedures. Um, and we do work with them quite frequently on innovative ideas for improving the fidelity of the simulation models. Um, this is a really cool link. Anytime you see Matterport, go to it because it's so awesome. It's, it's an immersive experience where you click on the link and they show you kind of the overview of the entire space and then you can zoom in on various things and click on items and, and learn more about them. So go to this if you have a, have a chance. Um, simulation centers are enterprise-wide, so that means Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Arizona, and Florida. The Procedural Skills Center is all about task training. It's all about um, tangible hands-on um, uh, dexterity training for things like catheterization, cannulation, wire navigation, et cetera. Um, and it's a badge, badge access for medical students, residents, really anyone who's looking to um, you know, gain more experience with a certain skill without having to gain access to a cadaver lab, which is pricey and, and unlimited. Um, and a lot of the items are 3D printed or otherwise manufactured. What this is showing is a, is a segmented aorta um, I provided to the Division of Engineering. This was, I think, back in 2019. And um, DOE has an incredible uh, glass, scientific glass blower um, named Steve, Steve Anderson. And multiple stories are out there on him. But he created this glass aorta so that folks could get a, a better handle on just the very basic skills of catheterization. And then this is navigation and stent deployment in the, the distal aorta here, the iliac arteries. Uh, Dr. Mark Mori, the same physician for whom we printed 37 elbows is the medical director of Procedural Skills Center. So with that, I'd like to um, complete my review. I appreciate your attention and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Amy, so much for that uh, really thorough review and just showing the wide variety of different opportunities that can be had and should be uh, put out there for so many people. Um, I'm going to ask everyone if you will um, send us your your questions and, and comments and stuff in, in the chat or the Q&A here. I'm going to save those to the end and then um, have uh, Dr. Ryan present now 
And then we'll hopefully you guys will send us some really good stuff to be able to pick um, both uh, Amy and Justin's brains here. So Justin, if you don't mind taking it away. Great, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you to the FIG. Um, my presentation will be focused on education, of course, uh, a bit more of the um, uh, career side of things, how we've implemented educational uh, pedagogy into uh, play here at Rady Children to bring staff up to speed, uh, and as well as learners. Uh, to give a little bit of background, I think it's important to understand kind of where we're coming from. Rady Children's Hospital is a, a nonprofit uh, institution. While we do have an academic affiliation with UCSD, uh, we are a freestanding institution. Um, with that, of course, comes some challenges on the funding side of things that we'll kind of explore uh, briefly. Uh, the 3D Innovations Lab, the Webster Foundation 3D Innovations Lab was established in 2018. I was recruited from Phoenix Children's Hospital where I had run a 3D lab uh, several years prior. The lab here has six different 3D printers spanning five of the different uh, ASTM technologies. And we produce about 100 to 150 anatomical models per year. Uh, we are in process of developing our QMS system so we can better support surgical guides and true medical devices. Um, but understanding this framework will, will help understand how we've implemented uh, our education process here. Current personnel for the lab, we're really a, a two-person team. Uh, for the core part of it. So I'm the director and research scientist. We do have a research engineer as well. Uh, and by and large, we, we comprise a bulk of the, the work product for the Webster lab. Um, outside of that, we do have learners and this really spans from undergrads all the way through fellows. Uh, we do have some smaller high school opportunities as well. Um, and then also recognizing that the three innovations lab here, we are, um, we are our own cost center, so we're effectively our own department, but we obviously depend strongly on most other departments here, specifically radiology. So we, we often leverage the 3D technologists that radiology has. Uh, we leverage the research associates from all the different departments um, you know, for specifically the IRB related work. And then other departments also have their own engineers that we, we cross collaborate with. So this really comprises the decentralized team and then even beyond that, we have the physicians themselves. Uh, one of the critical elements from the education standpoint from our perspective was establishing a steering committee uh, for the lab itself. So the steering committee comprises of both physicians and executive leaders here at the hospital that give voice to the direction they wanna see the 3DI lab go. And that's inclusive of education and simulation. So understanding the framework, we can go into a bit of the scope before we move into how we train our staff in these different aspects. So again, our, our primary focus of the lab here is anatomical models, as well as simulation and research. So leveraging the 3D data sets. As we develop our QMS system, we're gonna be moving more into the bespoke devices as well as surgical guides. So as this lab continues to grow and our opportunities to continue to grow, the question is, how do we train either learners or incoming staff? And really, it depends on these uh, kind of two questions towards the end here. You know, what are the implications created by a poor 3D reconstruction, a poor 3D prints? Uh, what is the time commitment to the individual? Both of these elements have a, a very significant implication on care delivered here, as well as the monetary aspect. You know, as, as Amy alluded to, it's very challenging to train all these individuals. So if they are gonna be going away, you know, right after a project is completed, you're probably gonna to wanna to tune the training specific to that opportunity. How we approach this again is by a risk gratification. So if we have a uh, perceived uh, lower risk application associated to a learner, we are going to deliver uh, information specific to them. So early on, we developed a uh, really anatomically focused manual for training individuals on the cardiac domain. So we would start with this. That would give them an understanding of the basics of, of medical images themselves and move into uh, cardiac anatomy and finally into mimics and provide this opportunity for them to, to get basic education. From there, we move into example cases that are supported through video tutorials that we created internally. So um, new learners can go in and at their own pace, uh, do some sample cases. 
From there, they follow into a shadowing process, uh, more example cases, and then we lead into a probationary period where they do segmentation that's overseen by uh, an expert. The more high-risk individuals, uh, they'll go through the same process. The probationary period would likely be longer, but then there's always a, uh, a review by an appropriate party. So probably blocking some of my screen here. Um, uh, this is our database that we use currently for tracking production of our uh, 3D data sets. So learners that would uh, proceed in the more advanced process, say they are residents, fellows, or learning 3D technologists, as they do 3D reconstructions, they would sign off on this uh, QA process that both timestamp and provide uh, what user completed which step as well as provide an opportunity for validation from a radiologist or a cardiologist or you know, a higher level user who would have an understanding of the images and make sure that the underlying 3D data is uh, appropriately representative of the underlying images. So this kind of encapsulates the process that we educate our incoming staff, but there is the process that's talked about more and more often now for, at these conferences is how do we train the providers, the people actually ordering the data your average surgeon, your average interventionist, they're gonna appreciate the 3D models by and large, but they not, may not have an appreciation of the process that it goes from medical image to a 3D print in their hands. So in our training process for the providers, it's making sure that we create an order set that is easy for them to utilize, but creates um, few opportunities for communication errors. We also wanna make sure that we have a feedback loop. So understanding what is the preferred communication style for that given surgeon, or maybe that department's culture is a bit different. So maybe they prefer text versus uh, email, or you have an internal communication system, make sure that you leverage that. But even anecdotally here at our institution, different departments have different uh, cultural expectations on communication. So making sure they understand that feedback loop is gonna be important. As you further develop your, your lab, educating your providers on the timelines, it's gonna be important. Don't overcommit and say, you know, while our J55 might be able to produce a model same day, by and large, that's not going to be a representative of an average workflow. And also, if it's in scope of your lab, leverage Ally 3D technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, that doesn't have the same time and uh, and costs associated to you know, a 3D print, but may provide sufficient information for a given provider. So it's providing not just education for our staff so they can be productive, but also for the providers so they can understand and be part of the process. One of the critical questions that, that we encountered early on, I imagine a lot of people encounter, especially if you're a smaller institution where you might have a you know, uh, single digit amount of personnel's, uh, uh, personnel leading a lab is really, when do you cross train or when do you specialize? And the considerations kind of come back to this risk element. You know, what are the expected redundancies? What happens if an individual who leads a 3D printing and maintenance aspect is sick um, or on leave for an extended period of time? What happens to your lab? So early on, we established what we are deemed critical systems for our lab and make sure that we have cross training across all of those specific elements. But it's also important as a leader of a lab to recognize when there is the need to specialize, uh, something that might not be mission critical, but provides an opportunity for your institution, your lab to be selectively distinctive. Um, and we experienced that you know, early on in our lab here. Uh, one element that we're you know, becoming more known for is our unusual recruitment. So, Early on, I recognized that software engineering is gonna be a very critical part of the lab that we wanna develop here. So I looked to an unusual community uh, that was uh, video game development. So I went on to Reddit and posted about opportunities that we had here at the Children's Hospital. So we had an engineer join our team with a background in video game development that's led to in-house software development. But this meant that this individual did not have a background in medical, did not have a background in image segmentation or a background in imaging. So providing the critical cross training was important, but not sacrificing the specialization that this individual brought to our team. So while we still did that same pathway of orientation, cross training, shadowing, um, they still provided an opportunity to build in-house tools. 
So here is a viewer that we built specific to our institution. We hope to scale it and release the community eventually, but we still have a ways to go. But this is a, a simple viewing platform for 3D anatomy, uh, but something more exciting to the community uh, is what we announced at Rapid, which is an opportunity for this individual to release software that will allow the encapsulation of STLs and OBJs into DICOM encapsulation um, and stored in packs. So, you know, overall, the, the message I wanted to deliver in this talk was uh, making sure that you're pragmatic in your approach for educating your staff. Um, I think a risk-based model is, is quite appropriate to, to deliver. So, um, you know, asking the questions about redundancies, asking the questions about cross-training versus specialization is gonna be important for you to have at your institution and leveraging a steering committee like we have, I think has been a, a great resource towards that. You know, on that, uh, my email is here and being recorded in this video, but uh, I am excited to hear any questions that the audience might have. Thank you, Justin. And I have so many questions on that tattoo uh, picture that you just showed. <laughs> um, so we actually got some uh, questions coming in from the audience and some uh, really good ones. So um, first question that was asked of um, all of us uh, was, with a variety of individual backgrounds coming into this field, what challenges do you see trying to effectively educate them in a standardized way? Justin, I think you actually, um, and looking at this question, you were just talking about cross-training and stuff. And I think that this kind of lends to it. How much, if you've got someone who's got a video game background, how much medical do they need to know? Do they need to know anything medical? And, and how do we standardize the knowledge base um, for our field? Yeah, I, I think even our, our panelists here were, were quite varied. Uh, you know, we have a, a medical doctor, we have uh, two biomedical engineers, myself, prior to being a biomedical engineer, I came from art. Uh, I got my BA in fine arts. So, you know, how are we all effectively speaking the same language? Um, the competency we developed internally is that kind of orientation packet that, uh, you know, cross trains to the basic foundations. So that packet that we created, you know, delivers basic medical information, basic image information. The average person isn't going to know what coronal versus sagittal are. So, you know, how do you communicate that information is going to be important. Um, along with that pack is the basics of segmentation, basics of how a CT scan differs from an MRI. So we have this, not just a packet for them to educate themselves on, but also a, um, a document that, uh, you know, I as a leader can check off to make sure that they're meeting these competencies. Uh, now, this is a very basic aspect, and it's going to be very challenging to encapsulate uh, a bigger multi-semester educational program in a packet, but it at least internally provides this document of, of education and understanding where we need to better develop. You know, if they're struggling at segmenting a uh, double outlet right ventricle, then we need to break down why that's the case and provide a more advanced educational uh, program for the individual. Excellent. Amy, yeah, do you have any ideas on this? Um, I think, I mean, if you look at the history of the, the SIG and a number of other groups, education has always been one of the main goals. Um, however, I think it's difficult to put together a complete curriculum and then try to get volunteers to populate it with content and put it out into the world. Um, so it's something that we talk about extensively is like, shoot, we really, everyone's got this tribal knowledge. Uh, we've come from different backgrounds. We know how to connect the dots for ourselves and our own local students, but how do we get this information out there? Um, it takes time and, and that takes money, right? So we don't know how to make that happen. And it's, it's kind of gone in this cyclical motion where we get really excited and we wanna do a curriculum and we wanna create content, but then no one's driving it home. Um, and I'm just as guilty. I mean, I, yeah, you know, it's, it's tough to find that time. Um, and then the other two things that I was thinking about um, are that there are educational programs being developed. Uh, Sarah Rimini is in the Additive Manufacturing um, Center of Excellence for RICO and is working on a curriculum and, um, and all sorts of educational components there. The VA hospital uh, is doing a lot with developing a curriculum. And 
and making that happen. Also on a smaller scale, uh, colleague Zachary O'Connor at WashU is also getting into education. So I think what we've been missing all, this, all, all these years is that we haven't had educators really pushing it forward um, and having that, that money that translates into the time to get it done. Yeah. So um, that's, that's what I think. And then there are two main components that I teach engineers, just on a side note. Um, medical vernacular and by the best way to do that is by going to grand rounds and weekly meetings for the different specialties and finding out if you can audit those meetings um, and then the second thing is cross-sectional imaging and we use e-anatomy um, and just help, help people learn um, indication by indication. I can speak um, for our experience on that um, you know something you just touched on Amy was finding educators. Um, when I first started my job, I, in my head, it was very much siloed, like here's my 3D job. And then over here, I'm a faculty member in radiology and there's my teaching job over there. And then suddenly you start looking at the two and thinking we should be working together on this. And so I'm very lucky that even our technical director, he is a radiology faculty member. We both teach medical students. We teach the introduction to, to radiology lectures. We teach um, even to the residents. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is create an educated workforce for ourselves, even selfishly. Um, and I know there's a question coming up that I'll touch on this too, but we're a small team. And so we don't have lots of money to go out and hire a lot of people. And so we thought if we had educated hands, and so even I, I talk about this, but my first, I'm the first lecturer of medical school here at USF. And I walk them through what is an X-ray and ultrasound and CT, MR, but at the very end, I add 3D so that there is a generation of doctors that never know any different, that this is not a field that is just standard practice. And that has really benefited for us because the people that are interested in radiology, that photo I showed was like about 30 something people, that's the radiology interest group. We get those people in, but also we've educated the field around us because now that some of those people, I feel like I'm saying how old I am now, but some of them have become residents and attendings and they go, oh yeah, I remember that lecture where you said, you know, that this is possible. Can we have access to that? So that's one of the things that we've really do, done is try to find ways to incorporate that into the lectures that we are giving. Um, and, you know, as Justin talked about our kind of 3D allies. So bringing out the AR and VR too, and letting them, you know, have that and access to that, um, kind of building that excitement and stuff. And, and then now as I get to work with some of those people as attendings, it's, it's been really wonderful. All right, so there's another question here. Um, they said, thank you for the great presentations. Hey, very good job, guys. Um, I am an assistant professor of radiology working at an oncological institute at Istanbul University. We have lots of ideas, but, are working in a low income country. So is it possible to have um, interactions with people in our, in our group um, or even face-to-face -face education um, where people can come and train? Um, so there, this person specifically interested in breast imaging, but I think that's a good question for a lot of um, people that are in um, lower income situations. Are there opportunities? And I think maybe both of you could talk about like how the SIG can play a role here in particular. Amy. Sorry, I always lose the mute button. Um, <clears throat> well, I just wanted to mention that there's an, a member of SIG leadership right now who is a breast radiologist and a breast expert. Um, and I don't know if we're um, posting her information or not on the website. Uh, it's Dr. Lou Mari Santiago. Uh, she's at MD Anderson, and um, if you are a SIG member, I imagine that you can get in touch with her through the SIG. Um, but the general question of, you know, working in a low-income country, is it possible to have online or face-to-face -face education? You know, one, one thing that COVID has done is kind of proven the value of digital education and that it can still happen. Of course, the studies are being done on efficacy and Etc. cetera, but um, I think there, are, there's a lot more digitally that can be done now. Um, and if you, if you connect with uh, groups who have educational um, opportunities like Mayo Clinic or um, Brady Children's, et cetera, um, usually there's a way you can find something that would work uh, by way of education digitally. Absolutely. Justin, do you have any thoughts on that?
Uh, right now, we actually have a, a cardiologist who's visiting us from a, a different country, um, and her background isn't anything about 3D. Uh, so she's spending a lot of time here, and from what I understand, she got a grant from her uh, country's health department in order to come overseas and, and do this uh, very specific research project because it provides an opportunity for her to educate herself about 3D printing, but then she can bring that back to her source institution. So. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what opportunities they're specifically uh, in Turkey for, for those types of grants, but that could be something to look for. Um, but certainly there are a lot of countries closer than the United States uh, that are in Europe that have uh, built 3D programs and might have some type of visiting professorship for this uh, more specific education. But also, as Amy mentioned, there are a lot of online resources now that do facilitate basic education, um, embody 3D, uh, does have a fair amount of, uh, this is a website, does have a fair amount of content on there that leverages uh, open source software. And while we as SIG don't uh, recommend using open source software uh, that doesn't have FDA clearance for 3D models intended for diagnostic use, you know, if you're using those programs for simulation or basic education for K-12 or something, that that might be a good route to go. That's great. And, you know, just like you, Justin, um, I know our team has people that we will um, do um, education for, like if they come, you know, we have someone coming, I think, actually in August, which is a brave individual to come to Florida in August during hurricane season, um, but they're coming from overseas, um, from Sweden, I believe, and so they will be coming and spending a couple of weeks with us. Um, but as both of you said, the online education I know that even during COVID, we were able to keep educating people. I gave a number of webinars and and even more guided education where we had people like seeing what our lab looks like and everything and have us working in the lab um, to uh, in the Netherlands and, and uh, Switzerland and different countries that were reaching out to us at the time. So I think that that is, um, we've all a little punch drunk from COVID, but I think it's one of the beautiful things that has come from that is the ability to have all the access to these tools. Um, there's uh, one last question as we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, with Without the ability to bill for clinical scans, how are these activities funded? Um, is it through grants, um, philanthropy, set-asides, any tips for people building from the ground up? Well, I can, if you don't mind, I'll start on this one. We had no money starting off our lab. I mean, I was a, a junior faculty member with um, uh, here in a radiology department. Um, and so we were able to build it, as I mentioned, by, you know, starting to train um, people like when we give lectures, I would go give grand round lectures, all kinds of stuff. Um, so it does take, you know, a time investment. So we didn't have any money, but by building thing activities like that, um, we didn't have um, the funding to start big training courses or things like that. So a lot of it was um, our own time and efforts and a lot of times relying on the tools that we had as an organization. So using teams, using, um, you know, whatever tools that our university and hospital provide to us, we were using those to be able um, to build an audience, um, if you will. Um, what about uh, you guys? Well, uh, for the programs that are paid, our undergraduate and graduate programs that are paid, um, we have an office of education, uh, I'm looking for the, fo the formal name of it, but they actually have some monies set aside to fund undergraduate or graduate research experiences. Um, and so if we're very lucky, we can secure some of that funding um, additionally, radiology is, is known most in most places for being a bit of a money maker for a hospital system, especially if they have a lot of imaging equipment. Um, and so that can help if you leverage, uh, just kind of ask nicely and connect with the right folks who are also passionate about education. Um, then you can usually do some persuading and, and get some funds for that. Our high school experience and our medical student and up experience is, is not paid. They just come and hang out in the lab. Um, I guess the money that we're funneling is the labor and the, the labor and love that the engineers and, and RTs are giving to these, these students to help them learn. 
um, but there's not a lot of money necessary for that. I think there is a lot that can be done on a, on a shoestring budget. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely happy to talk with any individual on um, getting started and, and, and how to get moving so that you're doing something meaningfully. Justin, do you have uh, anything you want to add to that? Yes, I can give the anecdote of what we experienced back in 2009 when we first built a, kind of a 3D program with Phoenix Children's Hospital that was really driven by collaboration with the university. So Arizona State University, I was a graduate student, my PI um, had the idea to do 3D printing for cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery. So that started this collaboration. Then a couple of years later, there was a grant opportunity for Arizona State to get a 3D printer. And that provided the springboard for, for establishing this lab in the hospital. So um, it might be very challenging for you know, a hospital to uh, dive into 3D printing, but leveraging educational uh, uh, institutions that are around that uh, medical institution might be an attractive pathway because the learners are also an opportunity for um, lower cost resources, I would say. You know, there is a very significant aspect for training all these learners. So I don't want to minimize it by any means, but really leveraging the educational partnerships can be, be quite important, especially for smaller hospitals. We did something similar here too. You know, we're very philanthropic driven, but we do really rely on UCSD for a lot of these uh, educational programs. I think that's a really good point because you can draw from them. And, and one of the things that we tried was um, we had access within our radiology department to 3D tools that they use clinically, but not to printers. So we actually did work on the 3D uh, computer side so that we could eventually pay for the printers. And so that is how I bought my first 3D printer was doing segmentation and, and consulting on the 3D side. Um, I, there's a great question uh, that just came in, um, and this is about... Um, Amy, you mentioned the MIT course and the Clarkson College Certificate Program. I know I've been very lucky. I, they invited me to give a talk at the Clarkson uh, College Program, and um, I did this online and got to interact with their students. It was amazing. They are so educated. I was really, really impressed by them, and it, it was done in the evening. Um, so, I mean, we could have talked all night. It was really exciting. So, and, um, I know uh, you mentioned Gabe Linky, and um, I think, I, oh, gosh, I forget the other people's names there, so my apologies, um, but uh, do you know, have any more information about like the MIT program that you're talking about and or anything about the Clarkson course? So I, I don't know a ton about the Clarkson course. I do think that it is geared toward registered radiology technologists, mm -hmm. not necessarily physicians or engineers or, or people getting started in the field. Um, but it is a huge step forward for, for the legitimization of what we're doing and getting that word out there and, and being able to hire a 3D RT to come in and help with segmentation and, and print prep from radiological data. The MIT course was all about designing innovatively um, and a lot of the core content um, beyond just reviewing the technologies, the seven major technologies of 3D printing, um, was in utilizing new tools um, like topology optimization or generative design to improve upon the thing that you're making, whatever it is. Um, and so I would say, you know, it's probably not a good course for someone literally just walking into their first 3D printing exposure, uh, but it is definitely good for, for someone who's got a little bit of experience under their belt. Um, I was for, very fortunate to um, get approval to have that covered when I took the course. Um, and I did, originally I had dollar amounts in there. Did I have that up, Summer, do you remember? I don't. I, I may have taken them out because um, I didn't want it to live on and <laughs> have the prices change. But um, yeah, you know, if you, if you put together a solid justification to your leadership on why you are interested in getting certified, um, and certified is, is a tough thing because it's a certificate, not a certification. And people who are in education know what that means, but really nobody else really gets it. Um, but yeah, so, so I would explore MIT. Um, but honestly, the first thing that I ever did was take the SME fundamentals course. And the prep work and the studying that needed to be done to ace that class or ace that exam was... Um, was a huge benefit to me. So I would also recommend that for, for newbies. Justin. All right. 
I think that, I mean, I think we've now just given like two thumbs up to those programs. So hopefully uh, if you're interested out there, I, I'm looking at the, uh, the roster here and we have a lot of people that are either newer in their career or even medical students. So I, as we wrap up, I want to ask you guys, um, what is something, if you had to look back at yourself, you know, when you first got started, what is it that you wished you had either taken a class in or studied in before going into this career? I know it's one of those, uh, but what's the one thing you're like, God, if I had only known that going into this? Probably um, medical procedural terminology. Mm -hmm. That was the highest, that was the most difficult thing. And then the cross-sectional imaging as well. Um, but like I said, going, sorry, Justin, going into grand rounds or going to weekly meetings for different specialties that you're trying to learn is extremely helpful. It's like an immersive, you're learning a language. So it is, it's a new language. Justin, what about you? Yeah, um, I, I think two things. Uh, the first one would be, I'd love to get basics of programming. You know, when I see what uh, our, our research engineer here can do and uh, a lot of these applications have APIs, so you can do a lot of, a lot of powerful things if you have a programming knowledge. Um, not that I can't develop it now, you know, I, that's certainly on my, my hopeful pathway. Uh, the other elements, kind of mirroring what, what Amy talked about, I think uh, even beyond uh, grand rounds, sitting in surgical conferences, sitting in and seeing how they discuss patients, how they kind of go through the process of reviewing medical images, I think is important because not only to get the education, but you see how surgeons and interventionalists interact with medical images. So you, you can find, you know, as an outsider, especially where there are gaps in this ability to review images and why it's there. You know, do they not have the right tools? Are they not looking at the right 3D reconstructions? Is their PACS or VNA limited? And you coming into that with a fresh perspective have an opportunity to hopefully develop something that, that uh, builds beyond those gaps. I think that's a fantastic point is, as medicine is its own language, it's its own culture in many ways. So knowing how to interact with uh, the people that you're going to be interacting with every day, I think it's something that even as that we try to train our residents in is that, um, yeah, I had a radiologist the other day come through our lab and say, I don't understand why all this 3D stuff is here still. And I'm like, ah, still even here, you know, we have to fight that but kind of educating your people. And then that means understanding how to talk. One of my colleagues said, you guys are translators. Um, the 3D team is a bunch of translators because you're talking to radiology and you're talking to surgeons and you're talking to different groups and engineers and everything. And you have to be able to talk all of those languages. Justin, you hit the one that I, I wish I had trained more. I took in my undergrad scientific software programming thinking, when would I ever use this? Um, and, and I did it and then I thought, oh, I'll never use that again. And I really wish I had kept going on that. I went th all through, uh, my graduate training and everything I was programming. And then I was like, I'm never going to use that again. And I really wish I had not stopped. So, um, those are definitely, uh, things, um, someone just commented that they did the Clarkson course and that was really useful and they're actually an MD. So, um, that's another vote of confidence for that. So, and we are not sponsored by Clarkson or the MIT. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, thank you guys, uh, both Amy and uh, Justin for your time. Thank you all for joining us today. And we hope like this was helpful, um, to learn our experiences. And again, this is just some of the stuff that the education committee that we're looking at, or we want to be able to help the field. And as you see, it's really hard to kind of narrow down the specifics on how we proceed. So, I mean, every one of these is like a whole world that we need to get into, but the education committee needs your help. If you are interested, again, reach out to me. I'm happy to do that um, and, and really tell us and share us things that are working. As, as you see, there are a lot of small groups here, low-income countries, but even low-income places here in the US um, that we all need that little tip that like, hey, that really worked for me, um, try this and, and things like that. So please uh, submit that stuff to the RSNA and to these other conferences, um, because that's how we all grow as a field. And again, this education will directly impact our professionalism and everything moving forward. So in order for us to become a fully category one billable field as we want it to be, we have to come up with these standards and so I'm excited to see so many people passionate about it. So I know my number one tip to all of you is find the people in your program, your hospital that are passionate about education and, and work with them because as both speakers presented, 
that is who you want to surround yourselves with that that passion that excitement and most people i i speak i know i'm often happy to give lectures for free because i love talking about um this kind of subject so really tap into the resources at your organization so again thank you everyone for coming i hope you learned something and uh we will uh see you guys soon bye thanks summer thank you have a good day